Uh, welcome to week four, um, SUNY uh, History of Jazz, SUNY Maritime History of Jazz. Um, I want to talk about the swing era in brief in uh, advance of introducing um, the music of Duke Ellington from uh, the week four SUNY History of Jazz YouTube playlist. Um, some quotes and interpretations coming from, again, John Sweat's Jazz 101, uh, a complete guide to learning and loving jazz. Okay, so Swed writes, so to call the 19th, we're, we're finding ourselves in the beginning of the 1930s, essentially, the end of the 20s into the 1930s, and parsing what the term the swing era uh, means. Uh, Swed writes, so to call the 1930s and 1940s the era of the big bands is misleading. Swing bands were modeled in part on marching bands and were divided into sections of saxophones or quote, reeds, the reed that is literally played um, attached to the mouthpiece of a saxophone uh, to produce sound. Trumpets and trombones, which were musically arranged so as to play against each other in call and response fashion and then come together for ensembles, as in for unisons, uh, rhythmic unisons, uh, what uh, are known as riffs, we'll talk about momentarily. So why, uh, why, why is it misleading then? As we are keep referring to in all of our discussions, it is convenient to place things chronologically, but in fact, things um, uh, life doesn't always work like that. And uh, the chronology of jazz, so to speak, sort of um, uh, melds from uh, collective improvisation, from small group interplay to larger groups by the 20s, 30s, and up really to the end of the war or to the beginning of the war and uh, as, re as revival of music ever since. But... Uh, the, the the reality is that their larger groups did exist before the swing era, uh, as it says, modeled on marching bands and indeed other larger ensembles of different configurations, including Western classical, larger ensembles. Um, but as contrast to, let's say, the Hot Fives or the Hot Seven Sessions, Louis Armstrong's uh, definitive 1920s small group recordings, right? Um, the big bands were a, a, a development away from both collective improvisation and polyphony, and also away from this rise of the soloists. It wasn't, it, it the big bands allowed multiple soloists, we will see. Uh, so, uh, more from Swed. Uh, he, he writes, the history of the swing era can be divided into two parts. The first, a period of pre-swing, transitional time, from 1924 to 32. Uh, and the second from... 32, let's say the early 30s, broadly speaking, all the way through the war to the mid-1950s, uh, really. Ever since, too, but as these two sort of eras of pre-swing and swing as the popular musics of their day. He points to the, uh, the two, so he says, the two, the two can be distinguished by the size of bands and the relationship of their parts. The flowering of swing phrasing and rhythm and the development of mature and individualized soloists. So let's check out each of those. Again, the size of the bands and their relationships of their parts. There were larger groups already in before pre-swing, but the ones that he is talking about that are defining it and beginning to give it a capital S for swing and perhaps a capital P, P-R-E, P -R -E, pre-swing, as somehow a unifying idea of what groups were like. They were not as big as big bands became. They were big. They were bigger than small groups, but they were on their way to being codified big bands. Um, the relationship of the parts, I think we really need to discuss. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> the relationship of the rhythm section to the soloist is one thing that we've talked about. The pianist, the bassist, the drummer, the guitarist, the tuba player instead of the bassist, depending on the era. The way the rhythm section and soloist, the hierarchy that exists, okay, we've talked about that. But what about the relationship of the other instrumentalists in a large group? What are they doing if they're just sitting there silently? Are they um, silent the whole time they're not soloing or playing the melody? No. No. Uh, the parts that, that the word is referencing are written, written parts, written sections, composed, arranged, orchestrated, and integrated into the ensemble along with the melody, the harmony, um, the rhythm. You know, the, the, the tune with the chord supporting it and the rhythm under it, the groove. But then the parts uh, that, again, that this quote is referring to are these written uh uh, cells. They're uh, riffs. In some cases, they're longer section riffs or short repeating phrases. They can be longer repeating phrases. They're ensemble parts. They're backgrounds. They're written 
pre-composed nuggets of various length that support the soloist, that complexify the melody with multiple layers of counterpoint. They do many things, but large, the larger point here is that we are beginning to see now the beginnings of codifying ways to improvise and write, to, to reconcile improvisation and written music at the same time. So we'll, we'll parse that more as we listen to Fletcher Henderson and to Ellington and to Basie and the ways that those different composer arrangers integrate the parts into their big bands. Now the different, sort of like, you know, if you think about it visually, take blocks across a horizontal axis and you take, you have, let's say the rhythm is at the bottom and the in, inner voices are in the middle and the, the melody and higher register voices are on top. How do you integrate even what would that look like? Well, there's, say, steady motion happening in the lower voices. The drums are playing the whole time. The bass or tuba, uh, bass begins to take over for tuba as the primary low-rooted uh, harmonic underpinning rhythm section instrument. The piano, the guitar, those instruments are playing, well, let's say the drums and the bass are playing almost constantly. The piano is comping, interjecting. Uh, on top of it, there's the melody or there's the soloist. But what's going on in between? Well, there's little chunks here, little chunks there some rest, little chunks here, little chunks there, different ways of distributing weight, essentially sonic weight amongst all these people in a group. There's not just five of us anymore, or seven, or eight, or nine. There might be 15 uh, in, in a sort of classic uh, second phase big band instrumentation. So what else to say besides the size of the bands and the relationship of their parts? The flowering of swing phrasing and rhythm. Okay, this is a very important point. We have to listen for this in, in, in the pieces we hear. It goes from essentially a two beat feel. The music goes from focusing on a two beat feel. Mm. Mm. Two, one, two, right? To a four beat feel. Ding, 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 one, two, three, four. Feeling all four beats strongly in addition to downbeats, one, two, three, four, instead of one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It's not that this is slower or faster. Two, a two beat feel, boom, boom, has that plodding thing, even if it's fast. Boom, ga-doom, 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 doom. A four beat feel is smoother, more fluid. Ga-doom, doom, 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 ga-doom, doom. You're emphasizing every four beats instead of two. It's changing the essential nature of how jazz rhythm uh, flows horizontally from, mm, come from this oompa marching band as well as other yeah, influenced uh, sort of basic uh, feelings of rhythm, de demarcations of rhythm to a longer, more fluid sense. It's also moving away from the bass drum, my cat, from the snare drum, away from mm, chick, mm, chick, one, two, one, two, to a four beat uh, rhythm sort of glided along by uh, stronger and stronger emphasis on the a ride by riding on a cymbal. Ding, jinga, ding, jinga, one, two, three. ding, 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 one, two, three, four, ding, ding, a ding, 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 ding. When I'm singing ding, ding, a ding, 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 is a swing, the swing, is the swing beat. Instead of going ding, 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 you're sort of creating this loping uh, syncopation. Remember we talked about syncopation in ragtime, say, mm, ch eh, up beats, right? You're adding syncopation to four beats. Ding, 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 straight. Ding, 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 ding. While you're still emphasizing every two beats, in this case, on the hi-hat of the two symbols chicking together. One, two, four, one, two, three, four. And against that, superimposing, or with it, superimposing on top, Ding 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 a ding ding a ding ding a ding 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 ding. That begin that that's a different rhythmic feel than. It also swings. That's two beat feeling, but it's more. Right, that essential change from to ding 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 a ding 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 a ding ding. Stretching rhythm. That's what Sweat is talking about. It's vital change in what happens rhythmically in the music, as we make our way through the swing era to bebop and beyond as we will hear. Uh, the third thing he points to are the is the development of uh, mature and individualized soloists. So we've already been talking about the rise of the soloists last week particularly, right? Armstrong. Um, Big Spiderbeck as sort of contrasting approaches. Uh, Sidney Bechet as another sort of Armstrong-esque virtuoso. This kind of, a, uh, we talked earlier on, Sonny Rollins, you know, the ultimate virtuosic soloist, etc., etc. What this is pointing to is a multiple, Simplicity of voices in an ensemble who are each mature and individualized soloists, as we'll hear when Ellington's band 
in Basie's band. In every big band, they made sure to have more than one soloist. Even, I mean, I say that the best ones, perhaps, or the most varied ones, I guess, is the more uh, more accurate way to put it. Meaning, Louis Armstrong and his orchestra, as we already talked about, toured all across the swing era, the bebop era, all these other eras that are to come, as as the Louis Armstrong and his all stars or whatever. And there were other solos in the band, always somehow second, third, quart, fourth, you know, kind of like hierarchy of who's the greatest soloist. But that's not really what this is talking about. What Sweat is saying is that we go, for, okay, we've started to experience the rise of an individual set against the rhythm section by having written parts, by having varied sections, a kind of orchestral approach, meaning an orchestra approach to improvised music and combining it with composed music, right? You're creating different settings across those horizontal planes. We're just talking about these little Lego pieces or, you know, blocks that go, you know, sort of horizontally across sonically, What how that would look visually. You're creating different sonic backdrops for different soloists. So one person makes a statement with their mature and individual voice, some written stuff comes in to support it, the melody comes back, the melody changes key, let's say, and uh, and moves from the saxophones to the trombones, whatever the specifics of the arrangement. Another soloist comes and solos over that space. There are now many voices in an ensemble that are both improvisationally mature and sophisticated and also set against all these different instrumental weights, ensemble colors, different timbres, right? Okay, what else is he saying? He says, um, uh, he points to also the the um, the pop I alluded to briefly the popularity of the string bass is beginning to be more prevalent also in jazz music in swing music, the tuba is more plodding, boom, boom, perfect for two beat right when it's time for four beat rhythm what we're talking about and the rhythm in the in the drums is going ding 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 ding, and the um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the tuba is trying to keep up going. It is more plodding and not as live as as a walking bass line. The walking bass line, you're walking all four beats, walking across all four beats or on each of the four beats. Remember we said ding, jinga, ding, jinga, one, two, three, four, there's the four beat jazz rhythm, ding, jinga, bung, ding, 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 ding. That works in a medium tempo like that, as could the tuba, boom, 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 but... Let's say the tempos, and they will start to get going. One, two, one, two, two, chicka ding, 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 chicka ding, chicka ding, 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 ding. The bass is much more live. Yeah, sure, it's a big instrument, but what are you doing? You're pulling the string to sound each of those notes instead of trying to push all this air through this giant instrument. And having there's a sort of difference timbrely. What happens when a string instrument sounds when it's plucked pizzicato, not bowed, right? Not bowed arco style. It's plucked, plucked each quarter note. Ding, you have an attack. That matches the ding, 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 four to the beat rhythm that's being rided on the cymbal, the, you know, the ride cymbal beat. They were made for each other, right? So we hear that, we'll hear that, you know, we're not going to hear the tuba as much. I love the tuba, but there it is, right? It's, and it comes back. The tuba has a role in jazz through the, the, the century and into our century, the 21st as well. But the bass takes over as the main rhythm harmonic underpinning instrument along with the drums. Um, yeah, he points to the drummer's lighter touch, as I uh, alluded to. Again, getting away from the drums and the bass, uh, the, the the kick and the snare, sorry, and getting to the, and focusing the rhythm more on this glistening, shimmering. Uh, my my uh, colleague of mine recently described, described it, and rightly so, as sort of a white noise in a way. If you think about it from say a, an audio um, <clears throat> audio engineer perspective, or just from 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 a, a sonic science perspective, an acoustics perspective, what's going on when you hit a cymbal? It resonates. Ding. It doesn't just go ding. It goes like ding. And the, the, the ringing decays, right? There's So if you keep hitting it, ding, 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 there's a sonic carpet happening. That's not really a carpet because it's high register-wise. The overtones of a cymbal, even if it's a low-pitch cymbal, is creating the shimmering like... The whole song, right? So... Uh, that is that was not the case in earlier jazz. We hear more of a percussion approach that was click 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 gong click these short decaying sounds. That is an essential change to how our ears begin to perceive um, rhythmic underpinning in all musics that came since jazz. The the rise of the symbols we can say also. So I alluded to this word arrangements already to arranger. Uh, Sweat writes the great arrangers could make the band phrase 
and move as if it were a soloist. So when the actual soloist played, they meshed perfectly with the ensemble. No longer would a great player like Armstrong or Beiderbecke stand out against stiff background rhythm or accompaniment as if they'd arrived from a different musical universe. Well, they had, but... Take a breath, because this is vital stuff, right? This is the arise of the composer and of the arranger as well. The person deployed, or the people deployed, to create the sonic textures for improvisation and composition to coexist is another important role. The jazz composer, the jazz arranger, the jazz orchestrator. We've talked about instrumentalists so far, the power of the way they played, the genius of their composition-like improvisations, right? Now let's talk about the genius of jazz composition, too. This is what this is saying. Uh, he writes, Improv improvised polyphony began to assume a lesser role in jazz. Why is it assuming a lesser role? Because to just have all, this, all the people in your big band ornamenting each other and phrasing freely behind a soloist is less compositionally clear we might say, less simple in a lot of ways, less direct anyways, than the composer or arranger specifying you do this then, you do that then, while well, you do whatever you want. Reconciling composition and improvisation. That is what we're talking about here. It says, swing was made possible by the substantial number of well-educated musicians in the United States who at this point could read or write sophisticated arrangements and by the development of a number of stylists capable of soloing. Check that out. What is that alluding to? Again, the, the reconciling of how to write for improvisers, how improvisers can improvise with writing. What made those kind of pursuits even uh, attainable pursuits or, or pursuits that were that were would occur to somebody to explore? Well, as he says, the fact that more and more musicians who improvised, also had been trained in how to write, how to arrange, how to orchestrate, meaning they had studied uh, essentially cla Western classical techniques of um, uh, formal composition. Composition means the organization of sound in time. So what are they studying? They're studying how to organize sound. It's not unlike uh, studying architecture, it's studying sonic architecture. Not from an acoustician perspective necessarily, but from a what do I need to uh, build as a foundation? You know, put it. You know, how do I put the foundation in the ground? What materials do I need to use? What is the width? What is the height? What is the depth? What is the weight? What is the mass? All those questions we can think of metaphorically as what um, writing a sophisticated arrangement uh, in, uh, requires. And then check it out. The other side of what Swed said. Not only is there this, you know, in this reconciling of comp composing and improvising, the rise of these trained, um, you know, um, wizards of Oz, each who could, from behind the curtain or out front of the band, either way, orchestrate and arrange the materials. There's also the rise of the people who can read them, right? We've talked a lot about the different kinds of, you know, uh, the earliest jazz coming from all these different sources, both African American and European and Latin American, um, as being vernacular forms and somehow, you know, uh, related to but independent of legitimate written uh, uh, forms. You know, you can one, you know, you can play a gig where you're only reading sheet music the whole time. You're not improvising, or you can play a gig where you're making it up and ornamenting the line as these different but related pursuits. Now, in improvising environments, we also have the demands placed on the instrumentalist to be able to read the sheet music in front of them, to count rests, to count uh, 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 the number of times that they do something before uh, the riff comes in, the repeating part, or before the solo changes, or before the break comes, or whatever it is, right? So not only can people write, they can read music. They can read. You can read... Uh, uh, as well as they can improvise, right? These are equal skills that begin to be valued for a jazz musician. That's an important distinction. Another one he points to, the development of sound film. Sound film, not silent film. Not early 20th century films with Charlie Chaplin and other maestros of the form uh, creating worlds without um, us being able to hear what they are saying, right? Now we have films where people are speaking to each other and we hear what they're saying on a screen in our beautiful Art Deco movie theater in 1930, whatever it is, 1928. Um, 
But with that, there was also the personalities of the big bands and the music of the big, big bands became to be became the backdrop, not exclusively, but uh, often the backdrop to sound film of the, of the time. It was the popular music of its day. Began to move out of the role of theatrical pit bands and take the stage. Between films at the biggest theaters, another aspect, not only is it the sonic, you know, the score to the film often, um, but they're literally, so remember, you know, um, uh, if we think about think about uh, uh, the earliest jazz and we, we've talked about recorded uh, history being um, history being history if we can hear it it's prehistory if we can't right what did it sound like in 1900 for an, uh, an orchestra to be in a pit as in under the stage a pit below right uh, not seen but heard uh, while you watch something on a screen that is no longer the case now up on the screen there's the music of the big bands and as part of these sort of variety nights, you watch the film or the newsreel, then you, you know, the film goes dark and you turn your attention and there's a big band. There's a big band, an actual group of 15, 16 musicians there on the stage and they play a set and then the film comes back and they're playing music that sounds like that, but different. And, but is film in of itself is a visual experience. How? Everyone's dressed in tuxedos. Uh, the drummer has a bunch of stuff besides um, his drum set or her drum set with them, i.e. Uh, uh, the, the bass drum cover, the drum you can see from the stage has a painting on it. There are um, exotic kinds of uh, other kinds of percussion instruments along with his or her drums. Temple blocks, wooden blocks from the Orient. Uh, Tom -tom, Chinese tom-toms, which are, you know, two-sided drums with uh, often at the time with uh, beautiful uh, uh, paintings along the side of the shells that you could see. Gongs, you know, all this sort of curiosa. Um, uh, coordinated movements amongst the members of the ensemble. All the above. You're, now, it's a visual um, uh, 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 entertainment as well as an aural entertainment. As well as something you hear, you watch it. This is, you know, it was already theatrical in its way ever since the beginning of the 20th century the end of the 19th century jazz is a theatrical art as a wow look at the way that person solos the you know the trombone or uh, the slide of the trombone or the 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 motions of the clarinetist or the whatever you know any anything is theatrical but now it's increasingly so what else does he say as preparation for this it says by the early 30s as we get into the end of swing part one into swing part two it was firmly established as the pop music of America. The bands could make almost anything work for them. Pop songs and riff tunes. Remember riffs, repeated little sections. Just a little section turns into a whole song. Sentimental favorites from the past. Marches, waltz, and arrangements of light classics. There was a form of swing for everyone. So the implication is, it's not just that swing is pop music. It's that pop music is swing music, right? All these kinds of music, other kinds, other genres, whatever. Marches, waltz, light classics, music from, you know, from the past. At that time, talking about, you know, music from the earlier 20th century or late 19th, whatever. Anything became a swing arrangement. It's not just to say swing was a kind of pop music that was popular for a while. Everything was swing music. It's hard to even find an analogy for the more, ver in, in some ways, more varied musical times that we live in. Not everything is pop music today. Pop music is not every music today, right? Everyone pride one or not everyone. Many people pride themselves on, oh, you know, have you heard my playlist? It's more, you know, roots than yours, or it's more secret than yours, or it's the pop one, but, oh, that's the pop one. You know, who, there's many different ways of parsing popular music today, but to, to, to summarize it for the era, for these swing eras from the 20s through the 30s, it wasn't, again, not that swing was pop. Pop was swing. Everything was swing music. Um, he says, swing of one form or another unified American taste, reaching every class, age group, and race, despite segregation, right? Musicians like Duke Ellington, who we'll talk about, ultimately became popular in every group. The big swing orchestras were spectacles of the first order. The music may have sometimes been hot enough, to threaten an older generation, but otherwise they were showcases of gentility and splendor, right? It's somehow like appealing to everybody. There's the hot, the cool, the sweet, the loud, the soft, 
the more classical, the more improvised, the more old school, the more new school, all versions of swing. Pop was swing, okay? That's the short version, not just, wow, jazz with pop music for a little while. No. Swing music unified America's listening for a couple decades in a way that no music, even... You know, other eras of pre, I was, you know, it's an obvious thing perhaps to say, or, you know, um, uh, 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 um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a truism. Oh, the internet has, has made everything so splintered or, you know, we live in post, uh, post, post modernist times of you have your playlist and I have my playlist and never shall the two meet, or maybe they do, but yours and yours don't, whatever. There's no possible way to unify things now the way they did. But even pre-internet, later eras, rock of the 60s, disco you know, of the late 70s and the very early 80s, Michael Jackson, Madonna, you know, pop music didn't unify the world. Sure, it did in the sense that, uh, you know, those pop, those popular icons were icons the world over, but there are other musics happening at the same time, at least never mind the world for a moment, because again, it, the discussion wasn't, uh, analogous somehow. I mean, pop, swing music became the popular music of, of the world in its way, certainly in Europe, um, and ultimately throughout the world over time. But just even just a snapshot of America for 15 years never has a popular music been so unifyingly uh, 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 all encompassing, even it, in its myriad forms across these, um, with the ultimate irony being that these are still in segregated times. This is a pre-civil rights uh, popular music era that uh, utopia of utopias was for everyone. Enjoy the music of the swing era, the pop music of the 1920s and 1930s.